Hello and welcome back to another episode of Massalia Tales. On the last episode, we saw the Sequani attack Delon's very depleted force at Dr. Duron, which has already held off a couple of invasions during the same end turn sequence. We somehow managed to rout them with heroic effort from Jelon's men, who of course are now even more depleted and are completely on the verge of destruction in the case of many regiments. Meanwhile, Eusebius was in Genua, hunting down the rebels that had risen up to retake Cisalpania from us. Their army wasn't very powerful, and Eusebius was well able to destroy them. Then Ariete army attacked the small task force I was building under a new general, Cretheus, hoping to defend Mediolanum from just such events. He was able to overcome them with help from the garrison of Mediolanum, although some of the enemy's phalanxes were able to employ some glitches in order to inflict more casualties on us than I would have liked. Now let's continue. When Melanthia suddenly stepped down from the head of the council, it was taken as a sign of a man seeking to quit while he was ahead. The empty space was filled by Eusebius, who in turn gave his space to Jelon, almost forcing him to accept the position. He hoped to maintain the council's authority by having all of the major political players be members. Meanwhile, Melanthios seemed to hang around the city, visiting minor nobles and listening with deep interest to debates at the People's Assembly. Few suspected anything from these harmless acts, but for Melanthios, everything was happening just as he and his ancestors desired. So Cretheus has just destroyed that small variety army that was raided into Mediolana, wiping them out in his first victory, with the garrison forces doing most of the work there. Very minor casualties, we killed a lot of them, a lot of um, upgraded troops as well were defeated on the enemy side, so all good news. I'm going to kill the prisoners for now. The variety then bring in a second army that immediately disappears, so it seems they plan to do something else very soon. You might remember last time I was trying to get a distant family member to join the council because he was a uh, promising general and he has now joined up. So in theory I can recruit him soon. So that army has disappeared as we can see. I was wondering whether they had more forces in Patavium as well. Either way, it seems the Daemons of Polymus need to move up to deal with the situation. Unfortunately, a Reti agent has halved their movement points so I can't do too much. I was planning, in fact, on uh, going on the offensive against Patavium. But this new situation and the lack of movement points means it's now best for me to just go and sit next to Mediolanum and wait for the Rarity to attack. I'm assuming they want to attack Mediolanum itself. They may also wish to just attack Cretheus, in which case I'm going to move him right next to Eusebius. So if that does happen, they can just team up. Plus, of course, they'll still have the garrison to help them as well. So the situation is quite secure. Now, strangely, because I uh, upgraded Divide Imperia to be compatible with Patch 16, it now seems to have changed the political situation, assumably because Massalia are now an actually playable faction in vanilla. What's happened is the council has actually become the opposition party, and the player party is now a group called the Temuchoi. This is a essentially the executive group of the council, which is what I was kind of assuming what was being called the ruling council was before, and I was referring to what it is now calling the council, as the People's Assembly. So essentially the game has forced everyone into the People's Assembly and put some random guy as the head of the council. I wanted to keep things a little bit consistent with how we've been going so far so instead this is going to represent Melanthios's plan to create a new political faction. So that faction is going to be the Timor Choi and the council are now going to be in opposition to this with all of our previous generals now on the council and just one noble currently convinced to join Melanthios's team which has 0% influence. So, so far the council have complete control over politics and gradually we're going to be trying to create an alternate faction and we may even be able to adopt some members of the council like Eusebius and Jelon onto the Timor Choi if we can get enough money and influence and the opportunity to do that. So we'll see how that goes. For now, the only real downside is that because our ruling party has 0% influence, we lose all of the bonuses having a lot of influence provides. So it's going to make things a little bit more difficult for now. Speak now some good news is that Athens decided to finally accept with peace with us, a long time coming, we and really it doesn't make too much of a difference. Your... The only opportunity it gives me is that I might be able to trade with them. They're not going to go in for trade though because they actually don't like me all that much. It claims they like me a lot, but not enough apparently. 
Now, although we are now at peace with them, I'm not going to forget the you crimes they committed against well. us in the past. One day, Athens will have to pay for trying to stand up to Massalia. To now, the Sestani offer me My military access in exchange for the same deal. People. They've offered this before, and previously I assumed they were doing it as part of some ruse. I'm able to test that now by throwing trade into the deal. When I do this, they refuse it, which seems to be a sign that this deal wasn't in good faith because trade would benefit us both. So, the Sestani are probably up to something, but for now we just need to worry about the Raeti. They have come forward to attack the Daemons of Polymus, which actually is the ideal situation for me because that's going to give me the best chance of defending against them. You can see the balance bar is already moderately far in our favour. The enemy have a lot of quite well upgraded spear and swordsmen, but we of course have the elite Daemons of Polymus, plus this depleted garrison force which will be able to team up with them to bolster the numbers, and Crethius coming in with a few light troops just to help out. I'm going to fight this on the battlefield because I don't trust Orta Resolve to leave me with enough men to counter-attack, which is what I really want to do now that I have so much power built up in the area. So I start with a simple formation, light forces in front, heavies in the middle, and a few light reserves of spears at the back. We're going to be changing things up because I have reinforcements coming in and I want to integrate these guys into my main formation. All of these regiments are, of course, at low strength, but together they'll still be able to form a significant part of my line. The enemy's army is looking indecisive at first, it sort of moves around for a while, and then eventually it starts moving towards a superb defensive position that it has despite being the attacking army. So it looked like they were just going to hold that position. So to begin with, both sides are going to spend ages setting up their formations, but eventually, once the enemy had formed up, they decided to just charge towards me, so that's ideal. So let's have a look at my formation. I've got missile units in the front. I've got a left wing uh, using all of those garrison units, but I'm going to bolster them with some swords who are going to go into the extreme left to flank the enemy. That left wing is in a two-line formation at the moment, but I'm going to change that up. In between the two wings of the army, I'm going to put some pike phalanx just to form a nice impenetrable barrier in the middle. And the right wing is going to be all of Eusebius's forces, with light forces extending out on the right flank to try and surround the enemy. Those lighter Gallic levies won't be too powerful, but should be okay as a raiding force, and they are supported by javelins, which will allow them to take out heavier units. Eusebius himself is just going to sit at the back for now. I don't want to put him in the line of fire. So overall, the formation is essentially a uh, sort of two-wing formation with a refused center. You can see what I'm trying to do, draw the enemy into the middle, which is slightly further back than the wings, allowing me to envelop them on both sides and get some nice strategic flanking attacks. And to help with that, you can see I'm extending out the left wing, using all of the garrison forces to get my men right around the edge of the enemy's army. And now I just have to wait for them to attack me and see if it works. As you expected, it hasn't taken him all that well to battle, but with the help of other officers, he's time to learn the ropes. He knows a lot about tactics, but little of logistics and people management required to run an army. The impression he gives that he would rather not fight at all, which doesn't sit well with the men, but it seems to impress the local leaders. I've seen too much fighting already. In a few days he will join New Sibis to do battle with a barbarian warband from the north. Should it be a chance to invite Eusebius to meet you? If you get on, he is a married. So first up, it's my skirmish forces engaging the enemy, the enemy charging right at them. They'll only have time for a couple of volleys from their arrows, which will of course do pretty much nothing against the heavily shielded enemy. So rapidly, I'm just going to pull these men back. They need to get behind our little bowl formation so the enemy can come into it. The enemy are charging all the way along the line, coming in right as I'd hoped, really. So I've got my guys to form hoplite phalanxes ready to receive them. On the extreme right, the Gallic levies will have a little bit of a harder time receiving the enemy. They can hit them with javelins as they come in, though. The enemy can do the same as they charge, but for both sides, the javelins do pretty much nothing to each other. So a strangely undeadly volley of javelins. Usually javelins kill loads of them. But anyway, the two sides now engage, the enemy having an advantage there, but hopefully I'll be able to outflank them. Along the rest of the line, I think I actually have the advantage. The enemy's medium swords won't do very well against the Hoplite Phalanx. They do have a few heavy sword units which might be able to break through. My Phalanx there, the Pike Phalanx, is taking missile fire. I need to actually move them out of that position because it's not going too well for them. You can also see on the left wing, the enemy has come in to engage the Phalanx, but not all along the line. So I'll be able to outflank them very easily. And of course, we have all the missile units behind the line who will now start chipping away at these huge blobs of enemy troops. 
On the right, I'm extending more troops ready to attack the enemy. The enemy haven't quite finished deploying their troops because some of them are coming in very slowly. But it looked like they weren't going to disrupt my flanking manoeuvre. Most of their men are going to come right in. This uh, Ligerian unit, which is actually quite powerful, will have the ability to break through my spears here. So this is actually the most dangerous part of the line. I don't have all that much support. It's just other light units. I have no heavy units on the right flank to stop them. So I need to win out here before the enemy get an opportunity to break through. The enemy's general tried to charge my spears and then turns away, seeing that that's a bad idea. I've got Crethius and some medium cav in the, in the area who will be able to lock down the enemy's general and hopefully defeat him with my superior cavalry, which of course will demoralise the enemy army. My right flanking action is now finally coming into effect, managing to surround the enemy's units on this side, but I'm also uh, creating a new right flank in order to receive more enemy units as they're bringing in reserves. On the left flank we have the enemy, uh, well, outflanked. The enemy's swords aren't going to be doing very well against my hoplites, even though they are heavy swords, even though I can theoretically defeat them, just because we have them under constant missile fire, they're losing too many men. And a huge strategic left flanking is currently in progress, so soon all of those units will be in big trouble. And in fact the enemy centre actually routes uh, quite quickly, and the left flank goes as well. So I'm going to be moving up at the same time, chasing them forward because the enemy has tons of reserve units behind their centre, mostly the slow-moving phalanxes which just form blocks of troops, essentially little breakwaters in the enemy's formation that I'm going to have to gradually surround and defeat, which is annoying because they're so hard to kill. So the battle is now taking place over lots of different parts of the battlefield, lots of little fights happening, and I have lots of free units on my side who will be able to come and start deciding these fights because most of them are essentially deadlocks. The most annoying situation is over here on the left flank. The good part is that we're fighting the enemy's slingers with swords, which is going to go well, but the bad part is that the enemy's phalanx unit is fighting my other unit with swords. And the phalanx unit, as I've mentioned, is essentially invincible, and the swords will actually be worn down fighting against them. But I have all of these guys coming in to support, all of the garrison units who are now freed up and start surrounding the enemy. This phalanx is now engaging with my pike phalanx. The pike phalanx is actually doing pretty well against them, it seems. We found the weakness of the enemy's heavy hot is actually attacking them with pikes. Unfortunately, they only have the one regiment. Elsewhere in the centre, Eusebius has been fighting against one of the enemy's phalanxes, but he actually was taking heavy losses, so I had to pull him out of that engagement because his unit is heavily bloody. Luckily, I still find something for him to do, so he'll still get to do some fighting. The enemy unit behind him is about to rout, so he can charge into the rear to make sure it happens, and they actually rout just as he's coming in, so he'll get the opportunity to destroy these routing forces. This pretty much constitutes the end of the enemy centre. We have so many units being freed up by this routing that we're going to be able to overwhelm all of the remaining pockets of enemy resistance, even though there are quite a large number of those pockets. Some of the enemy units started coming back from routing, actually, which was proving inconvenient. I had to change things up a bit and receive them with some of my uh, more tired units. Luckily, the enemy are tired as well. Plus, I still have a few missile units with ammunition who will be able to deplete their already depleted numbers further, so it won't take too much effort to rout these guys. All these guys coming in here, coming back from routing as well, you can see there's quite a lot of them. A lot of them were actually just slingers and missile units, so I could just chase them away with my cavalry and they'll quickly be defeated. The remaining spearmen didn't really want the fight for very long, see the bounce bar really far in our favour, getting more and more far by the second. Eventually, a chain route ensues, all of the routing forces go into full shattering mode, a decisive victory is ours so we've successfully destroyed this rarity force and i believe that was their main force which is ideal because i really want to counter-attack them and i think both of their settlements are now going to be undefended so now let's have a look at the battle results from the engagement we lost about a tenth of what the enemy lost in the end so overall a quite fantastic result the chase while the show up is another enemy reinforcement army which was being deleted off screen i have no idea where that army actually was i think it might have been in the direction of patavium but anyway as you can see the enemy's army has been devastated they will not be able to fight effectively anymore they certainly won't be able to do anything against mediolanum i'm going to kill the captives normally i would enslave them but uh mediolanum and Cisalpania in general is on the edge of rebellion yet again and adding slaves to the population just makes things worse there's already quite a lot in fact so moving on into winter i wanted to counter-attack the Raetti to prevent any more invasions coming from them again and of course steal their territory 
To the east, Batavium looks pretty much undefended. It's got an okay garrison army, but Eusebius will be able to take them on relatively easily. Before I did that, I wanted to see if I could deal with this agent. The agent has been killing men and reducing the movement points of both Cretheus and Eusebius' forces for a while, and getting rid of them will make campaigning generally easier. So I put a load of money into attempting a manipulation. There was actually an okay chance of it working for once, but it did not work. Very unfortunate. Here is Coria, the Reti's main base. I'm not going to attack that for now because they may actually have forces there. I might save that for Jella and we'll see how it goes. So for now, it's just Batavium going to come under siege from the Daemons of Polymus. As I approach, the balance bar is pretty far in my favour, but I want to fight this battle myself just because I know the Nori to the east, who I'm also at war with, will probably counterattack this province because then we'll actually be bordering them. So it depends what sort of forces the Nori have, but I don't want to take any risks, so I'm going to engage this one myself to minimize casualties, as previously auto resolve has been quite mean to me. So let's head down onto the field. It's the question everyone cannot escape. What is the right thing to do? These Raeti, who have hounded our people for decades, now stand on the edge of destruction. Young Cretheus tells me that we should turn the remaining tribes into allies now that the elements that despised us are mostly dead. He forgets how the world would see such an act. It would be traditional to extract reparations for our losses and cripple them so that never again can they attack us. That too seems to leave an opportunity missed. Thus I say, we keep adding these peoples to our republic, turning them not into allies, but into our very flesh and blood. It's a freezing winter's night, surprisingly well lit by the full moon as the Daemons of Polymus advance on Patavium. I thought using a night attack might give me an advantage. It's actually the first time I've attempted a night attack. You can see our men are slightly illuminated by a strangely white light from the torches they're carrying, the enemy doing the same. It's kind of like an ambush, I believe, so the enemy hasn't started actually deployed for a defense, but they're going to have plenty of time to set up their defensive formations before I reach the edges of the town, so they'll be okay. You can see I'm approaching from three directions, with three roughly equal groups, so the main group is approaching from the south. And you can see on the tooltip, the enemy has a reduction to their morale because they were not prepared for a night battle, so essentially it will just be slightly easier to defeat these enemy units under these circumstances. So, what I need to do now is start moving up, see what sort of formation the enemy take up and begin my attack on the town. As I got close, I decided to start bombarding the enemy with archer fire. The enemies have set up a static formation here defending the approach up towards the capture point. The arrow is doing pretty much nothing to the large shields of these Celtic tribesmen, but I'm just going to leave them firing because I need to waste some time before all of the rest of my units get in position to do an actual assault. You can see they've also heavily defended the capture point itself. Many of these troops facing north against my other group coming in. The enemy probably could overwhelm this group. They do have their garrison warriors up there who in theory can beat Hoplites, possibly even from the front, so they have a bit of a chance there. On the south it's mostly just tribesmen who uh, are basically light spear units who won't do well against the Hoplite phalanx once I get into position. But I'm going to use the leisure I have of the attackers initiative to bombard them with a bunch of arrows before the attack actually starts in the hope of actually killing some of them. The enemy decided to take that initiative away from me though on the north part of the battlefield by just attacking out as my forces were starting to set up on this choke point. You can see I'm actually on a downhill slope here. I decided that I'd use these hoplites to charge forwards at the enemy rather than receiving them normally because the ground is slightly flatter up there. And you can see the men of the Davis Eponymous are not afraid at all of these enemy forces. They seem pretty confident of a victory. So the enemy rushed down and engaged against the front lines of my spear units. I have all of these missile units behind the lines. I've got javelins, I've got slingers and archers, all of which I'm going to try and use to deplete the enemy's numbers very quickly, especially since the fact that the enemy has sent one unit out has uh, really ruined their chances of defending the middle because they only have two of these units which are going to do well against my hoplites, but I'm fighting them three on one now, so it's a perfect opportunity to defeat them. On the other side of the battlefield, not much is happening. I'm still hitting the enemy with arrows. Even after a couple of minutes, I've only killed a handful of them. The enemy keep changing their formation to put the best unit at the front, so none of their units get particularly depleted as a result, which is a pretty good idea, especially for low morale units. Now I've got some javelin men onto the flank of the enemy's warriors, and you can see those javelins are tearing the flank of the enemy's formation apart. These lightly armoured enemy swordsmen can't do anything against this javelin fire, and they are going to be very gradually defeated by my hoplites fighting them from the front as well, since they have such a numerical disadvantage. 
However, the enemy are now finally sending in their actual reinforcements to try and make this fight worthwhile. Another unit of the same men comes to stand at the back of the initial unit, the initial unit having almost been destroyed. So they're going to join the battle, but of course they're coming right into the line of fire of my javelins as well. So now they're going to suffer a very similar fate. Plus I'm moving up another unit of javelins. The archers and slingers can't really do anything because of the poor line of sight. So they were pretty much useless. The archers will be able to arc a few shots over into the enemy. The slingers aren't going to do anything. You can see it is the javelins getting the majority of the kills against the enemy and doing quite well actually. Now on the other side, the enemy started charging out towards me. I was also moving towards them but not paying attention and as a result, my pike phalanx is caught out of formation by the enemy tribesmen. Luckily, even out of formation, this pike phalanx is good enough in Malay to defeat that enemy unit and it actually lets me set up a pike phalanx even after I've already engaged in Malay. I thought Rome 2 didn't let you do that but apparently it does. So we're going to force the enemy to fight my pike phalanx from the front in a very cheeky move. The enemy are committing all of their forces really to that part of the fight but since I'm coming from all directions they're going to very promptly find themselves surrounded. Back on the north part of the battlefield the enemy have pretty much just committed everything they had defending the capture point to rush down and attack this Hoplite phalanx line. My javelins are going to do the best they can to kill the enemy but now there's so many of them we can't actually kill enough because our javelin ammunition is very scarce. So we are going to have to win out on this side of the battlefield and then go and attack the enemy in the rear to actually thoroughly defeat them. Luckily things are going very well here, you can see my swordsmen have now arrived to engage with the enemy's tribesmen. The tribesmen will not hold out for very long against the superior sword infantry. Eusebius himself has taken his guards to engage another unit of tribesmen at this little choke point. The enemy did have some archers just behind them who were firing at Eusebius, but luckily for me I have yet more forces coming in from another direction. These swordsmen will come in to engage the archers in close combat. These Celtic local bowmen are not going to last very long against our heavy sword infantry. So this unit is actually going to rout very quickly because they don't really need to take any losses before they go. They're only a garrison militia unit. So with all of those units locked down, I actually had more free units that I'm going to use to go up towards the capture point where the enemy have a lot more of these local bowmen. Most of them aren't actually doing anything. They could be quite threatening firing out at my formation, but I'm going to go and lock them down in melee just to make sure they can't possibly do that. Here we have a slight issue in that one of my units has got turned and is now fighting the enemy exclusively on their own flank. Perhaps they're just showboating there. I didn't actually realise, of course, at the time, so they'll just have to take a few extra losses as a result. The main part of the enemy's force has been severely depleted by javelins and is beginning to get outnumbered by my hoplites. I am fighting uphill, but we are actually pushing them back quite easily. The enemy's infantry are low in quality and my experienced veteran troops are well able to defeat even guys who should be winning against them like those heavy swordsmen. On the other side of the battlefield all of my men are rushing in to engage the enemy's bowmen now. Most of the enemies uh, on the south part of the field have been defeated so I can just commit all of my infantry in. Some of them are staying behind to just rush around and kill routers because there's almost no point in bringing everyone over to the other side of the battlefield because I suspect the battle will be over before they arrive and indeed that is the case. The rest of the enemy's army chain routes as one side of the town falls leading to a decisive victory. So this means Patavium will now be ours and of course capturing Patavium means that Cisalpania has been unified under Massalian rule. It may be hard to hold and they're definitely going to rebel more than once perhaps. We'll see what happens next time. As 257 came to an end, the Massalians saw that their fortunes had truly reversed. No longer were they surrounded by enemies and no longer were their historic enemies able to reach the city. But on the other hand, they were not surrounded by allies either. On all sides, the Massalians had old foes and tolerant trade partners, but no friends save for the Hellenic tribes of Illyria who were busy trying to repress the proud Italian cities into paying tribute to their growing kingdoms. It was a precarious time, a profitable time, and most of all, a time when nations rose and fell on the words of a few well-placed men. <laughs>